we're here with Dan Lillian Quest, is another uh, candidate who stepped up to uh, challenge Senator Hatch this year. How are you doing? Good, Dan. Nice to see you. Thanks for uh, thanks for meeting with us. So tell us about yourself. What's your background? I'm Dan Lillian Quest. I grew up in Idaho. I, my background is study economics at BYU. I have a law degree from the University of Chicago. I spent my career in consulting, turning around businesses. I worked with Bain Consulting. Uh, I worked in the Fortune 500 world before jumping out to be the partner and president of a, of a small business in Roy, Utah. I ran for the state senate in 2008 and was elected on a platform that I would get in. I would work hard to stretch every dollar to make good financial decisions for the state of Utah, and I've worked to do that. I focused on things like pension reform and Medicaid reform, which are our two biggest financial issues in the state. And we've had some unique success in, in changing the direction of, this, of the state on those programs. And those two reforms should save us billions of dollars over the years to come. So we're very excited about that. I'm running for the United States Senate because it's really time for new leaders in Washington, people who will tackle the spending issues that we face as a country nationally. All of our lives we've known these, these programs would lead us to this point, programs like Medicare and, and Social Security that need to be protected and, and preserved for the people who paid into them all these years, but also the 185 different federal welfare programs that need to be reformed, returned back to the states. We've got to live within our means as a country, and the real debate around this is going to happen in the next 10 years, and I want to be there for that debate. That's why I'm running for the United States Senate. What are the principles that have drawn you into the Republican Party? I'm a Republican. I support the Republican platform. We're, we believe in individual responsibility, individual liberty. A government's role is to protect and preserve the rights, not to dictate the outcomes of situations. That the individual should be free on their own to make decisions and, ha and to have the rewards and failures of those decisions. The Republican Party values life. It values rationality. It values uh, not only conservative fiscal policy, policies, but conservative social policies as well, which defend the family as a fundamental unit of society. That's why I'm a Republican. I think we've got the right ideas, and I support our Republican platform. So which of the founding fathers would be your favorite? Stated differently, which of the founders would have had the most influence on your ideology? My favorite founder is John Adams. John Adams was a patriot in every way. He understood the individual liberties. He stood up for people's rights. Even the people the, in the Boston Massacre, the English soldiers who deserved a right to a fair trial, he stood up for that. He advocated for it. But he also was fearless in his, his defense of the Constitution and of liberty. And he recognized that, that our way of government, our way of life, that it was meant to be a republic where people served, uh, people left their plows in the field, left their goods on the shelves as merchants, and went and served and they would go home and live with the consequences of their actions. John Adams was a patriot and a man that I respect who understood the proper role of government and did his best to, to live by constitutional principles that he helped craft. What are your thoughts on the 16th and 17th Amendment? And would you uh, repeal them or do you support them? I support the repeal of both the 16th and the 17th Amendment. With respect to the 16th Amendment, that's the income tax amendment. My personal feeling is that a consumption tax would be more fair, uh, kind of like a fair tax where everybody uh, pays based on what they consume. The income tax amendment really kind of sets in statute the idea of redistributing income from one group of people to another, and I don't think that's a proper role of government. Uh, so, but to get to a fair tax, you've got to repeal the 16th Amendment, or you'll end up having both. So I'm in favor of repeal the 16th Amendment. It'll be tough to do, but I'm in favor of doing that. The 17th Amendment is even more problematic. It used to be that the state legislatures would select the senators. And that was how they preserved state sovereignty because they would, their senators, if they were getting too, too high-minded to try to drive power to Washington, the legislatures would call them home. When that was passed, that bill was passed moving uh, the choosing of senators from the legislature to the people. Senators started getting elected. They would disappear for six years. They'd come back with, with hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars, in their campaign war chests and dare people to run against them. As a result, we've shifted more and more power to Washington. We've lost our way with states' rights. And it used to be that the Senate was the balancing power in this country between the states and the federal government. And we've lost our way. I'm in favor of repealing the 17th Amendment. But if we can't repeal that, I will also abide personally by the 17th Amendment, working closely with the legislature to make sure that I'm addressing issues that are important to the state of Utah. What accomplishments as a state legislature are you most proud? 
In the last two years, we have passed two of the, mo of the largest financial reforms in 50 years in the state. Both of them were my pieces of legislation. One, reforming our state pension system, which really is a problem for states all over the country. But we're the first state in the country to close down the old system, to move people to a new system with a set amount where the state contributes, to end the abuse of uh, the practice of double dipping where people are retiring one day, coming back to work the next day, getting a pension and a paycheck. And also we ended pensions for legislators. That was a big deal. I went to 16 state last year and worked with 39 total helping with their, with their pension issues. That's something the state of Utah I think can be proud of. At least last year I also worked on Medicaid reform legislation. We're the first state in the country to cap, to agree to cap Medicaid spending to reformulate how that program is run and return it back to state control. And we passed that bill unanimously. And that's exciting stuff. We're showing in Utah that we're willing to take on the long-term financial problems of our country, and uh, I'm very proud of that. Is there a something that you would try to accomplish in the state legislature that you weren't able to quite get done that you're really disappointed with that you would have liked to have had go differently? There was one bill I tried to pass in the legislature that uh, I did not have success passing in my last session, which was the bill to eliminate the lifetime health care benefit that state legislatures get if they serve 10 years and, and retire over the age of 62. I thought it was too generous. I don't think we need that. Nobody else gets it. So John Dougal, Representative Dougal, ran the bill in the, in the House. I ran it in the Senate, and I couldn't get the agreement to get it up on the board in the Senate. But the good news is my last vote in the legislature was actually in our caucus meeting in November before I resigned to run for the U.S. Senate. And I got my colleagues, worked with my colleagues to agree that we would end that practice and the legislature followed through this, this last year it did, which I'm excited about. How do you feel about the Utah solution for immigration, HB 116 and what have you? Would you have done anything differently? I voted against House Bill 116 because I thought it was unconstitutional. One of the provisions of the bill is said if you don't get the federal waiver required to do that, the state of Utah was going to proceed anyway. It's very clear in Article 1, Section 8 that Congress has authority over naturalization, which has always been interpreted to be immigration and naturalization, and I think it's a federal issue. I can understand why the state is frustrated, however, in trying to get something done on immigration to force the issue, because it's been an abdication of the federal government for far too long. We need to get back to the basics, secure our border, open up legal immigration so that our businesses and our, in this state can get the labor they need for their specific jobs, and we've got to make sure that we are ensuring that people's identities are protected with an e-verification e system as well. On the subject of economics, would you lean more towards a John Maynard Keynes approach to the economy, or do you prefer more on the lines of Ludwig von Mises or F.A. Hayek? I'm an Austrian economics guy. Uh, the folks who want to use monetary policy or fiscal policy on a macroeconomic basis to drive an economy have got it all wrong. It was Hayek and Mises and others who recognize that it's individual uh, economic decisions that really drive an economy. And the government can't direct everything. And so I, I'm from the Austrian school. Let markets work. Let individuals succeed and fail on their own. And things will turn out better than having the government try to direct which direction people should go. I have to ask the question just because the media just keeps bringing it up and won't drop this. but. Do you or any Republicans you know plan to take away contraception? The issue of contraception is not about whether or not the Republicans want to take away contraception or not. We're not trying to do that. But we do think those religious institutions who have the right to express the freedom of religion should not be dictated to provide for certain things that are against their beliefs. And I think that's what the, this, this debate is about. It's about First Amendment rights to the free exercise of religion. And those rights shall not be infringed. And I look at what the Obama administration has done to try to force their values on religious institutions like the Catholic Church. I don't think that's appropriate. Along those lines, what's been happening with Rush and some of the comments that he made and the demands for censorship from some activist groups, would you feel that the government would have a role in regulating uh, talk on radio? Or uh, would they taking it a step further with the recent escalations that have been going on with the attacks on small business that have been coming, do you think that if free speech on the radio is protected, does the government then have the obligation to uh, stop the harassment of small businesses that um, support these talk, talk show hosts uh, through advertising? Rights to freedom of speech shall not be infringed. You have the right to say what you want on the radio, you also have the right, people have the right to 
to say to the sponsors who are sponsoring that radio program not to sponsor them. That is the right to freedom of speech. When the government starts getting into the business of deciding who can say what and when, we're in trouble. So Rush Limbaugh is a grown man with his comments, the reaction to those comments. Um, he, uh, everybody's entitled to react the way they think. But the government should not be involved in that decision. If you're elected, what recommendations would you make to the Senate and to Congress and to the President to quell the flames that are going on in the Middle East? I'm not sure you can say much to calm down problems in the Middle East. But we are funding both sides of the war on terror. We're buying oil from Saudi Arabia, and they're funding the madrasas that train people to hate us and want to kill us. The way to get things calmed down over there is to take care of our own energy needs here. We have abundant resources, oil and gas, with the recent advancements in fracking technology, we've opened up huge new oil reserves that have been previously untapped and unavailable. We should be developing our own resources here, taking care of our energy, energy needs here, and not be so embroiled in the Middle East. Aside from drilling, what else can be done to bring down the price of gas? The price of gas is going up for a couple of things. We need to drill and produce more oil. But we're also printing money like crazy in this economy. You're seeing actually inflation on all kinds of commodities, from food to gas to, to copper to gold, silver, and other things because the Federal Reserve is printing money to cover our debt. When you borrow 10% of your economy, and the Federal Reserve has to step in to buy treasury notes that is pumping cash from the economy, chasing the same number of goods and services. Well, if you have more cash chasing the same goods and services, you end up with inflation. If you want to keep gas prices low, keep inflation low, Congress needs to balance its budget so the Federal Reserve can stop printing money. And also, you've got to develop oil and gas resources here in this country. Thank you so much for yeah, your time. Yeah, I want to close you. Good to see you again. Right? You too.